Thank you for coming to our session on uh, guiding principles from NACAC's Code of Ethics and Professional Practices. Um, I'll take a second before we introduce ourselves to ask you all how many of you are already familiar with NACAC? Most everyone. Okay, good. So we'll just breeze right through the first slides. Um, I will note that I'm David Hawkins, Executive Director for Educational Content and Policy at NACAC. And I am joined, I'm very happy to be joined by my esteemed colleague here, uh, and Michelle Brown. And Michelle, I will let you introduce yourself. Okay. So a little bit um, just about my background and who I am. My name is Michelle Brown. I am the Director of Student Recruitment and Outreach at Oakton Community College. I have been at Oakton Community College for 16 years. Um, working in admissions and enrollment management and recruitment and outreach. And prior to my work at Oakton, I've worked with transfer students at uh, large public institutions at University of Illinois at Chicago and at mid-sized private institutions at Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, so over 25 years in admissions with transfer students and transfer student work. Um, one of my first jobs after graduating with my undergraduate degree in psychology from Illinois State was to work for UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago, and to travel around the state of Illinois, visiting community colleges, and putting together articulation agreements. So this was a long time ago when they didn't even exist and we were actually creating them as a state. Um, so that was my kickoff into transfer admission, which led me to where I am today. And the reason why I'm here speaking in front of you is I've been involved in my um, Affiliate Association, Illinois Association for College Admission Counseling for many years. I'm a past president of that organization. And from that activity, I got involved in NACAC, the National Association for College Admission Counseling. And just this past couple years, I'll talk more about this later, but I've, I had the opportunity to sit on the committee that revised the statements and principles of good practice. And I co-chaired the transfer subcommittee, and that's going to be the bulk of what we talk about today, the additions of the transfer portion of the statements and principles of good practice for college admission counseling. So um, I think that's enough about me. I'm going to turn it back over to David, and he's going to kick off with a little bit of data, and then we'll get into the SPGP information. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, we did just embark on a complete overhaul of really what NACAC's founding sort of core is, which is our statement of principles of good practice. We even went so far as to rename it, which is really bold, uh, and we'll get into that, into that in a minute. Now, but since most of you know about NACAC already, I just wanted to sort of throw out some, some numbers here about how long we've been around, how many people we have in our membership, uh, what our state and regional affiliates look like. You can see there are a lot of people involved and a lot of member input. We prize member input um, quite highly. Uh, and I'll note that our membership has grown quite significantly over the years. I've been with NACAC for 18 years, and I believe when I started, we had about 4,000 or so members. So a lot of growth over that time, and I'd love to say it was because of my presence, but I'm almost certain that it wasn't. Uh, so just a little bit of background to really just set the table for what Michelle's going to do. She's going to really walk you through the process we went through to, to overhaul this, this, our statement of principles and really focus in on what's new and what's very specific to transfer in the new document. Um, I'll note that we do have hard copies out at our table out there, so if you haven't gotten one of those, it is, of course, available online, but we do have hard copies out there. Um, we started uh, a few years back, actually, uh, with the, the, the Transfer Advisory Committee. We convened a group of folks uh, who spanned the, from school counselors to uh, transfer admission officers to transfer advisors to four-year admission officers, got them in a group, and had them come up with some recommendations for what NACAC could do. And I won't read through these word for word, but you get the sense that we really felt like that there needed to be some positive communication out of NACAC uh, to help what we say here combat the stigma. I think that's almost too pithy it's to capture everything that we need to communicate. Uh, we also wanted to take a hard look at what NACAC does, because a lot of folks who've been in NACAC for a long time feel like we're a very four-year centric and you know direct from high school to college association. So we are in the process of, of changing that. Um, we, we have gone through just about all of our programs and now have transfer as an element of every single program at NACAC. 
Uh, we also felt that uh, out of this committee, we got the very clear recommendation that we need to have more networking and communication between transfer professionals, high school counselors on the, the intake side, and four-year admission officers on the, on the sort of the out, outgoing side. And then finally, building our strength through collaboration. And this is where we've so enjoyed our, our partnership, really, with NISTS. Uh, over the years, because I think we, th this does benefit us in so many ways. In fact, Janet Marling is, is the, an appointed member on the NACAC board right now, a very important voice for us. Uh, again, to set the table, uh, just, just a few data points and then I'm going to hand it back over to Michelle. Number one is that uh, you see here nine in ten uh, undergraduate institutions, uh, four-year uh, first-time admission offices, uh, rated transfer students as a considerable important, uh, considerably or moderately important to enrollment goals. All of which is to say that four-year colleges are really honed in on transfer right now. Um, and on the one hand, um, you know, four-year institutions are looking to, to meet their enrollment goals. Uh, and that is a very market-focused sort of thing. But when you think about it, 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 it creates a fit uh, from their market need to the needs of transfer students. And I think the reason that NACAC has gone so far to try to overhaul our statement of principles is that whenever you have a new or developing market, in any segment of the economy or the world in general. You have actions that are experimental, some nefarious, others accidental. And so there are a lot of rough ed uh, edges to these things. So this is clearly there's a need for us to, to, to be involved based on the interest uh, of four-year institutions in transfer students. Uh, these, these data really just speak to the prevalence of transfer in the conversations that our four-year institutions are having. 90% uh, of public colleges and 70% of private uh, have some sort of articulation agreements. And I, just, I know that's, that's a big change even in, in my 18 years at NACAC, and I can imagine over the longer arc of history that's even, even more significant. 52% uh, of newly enrolled transfer students come from a community college, which says something about the, the dynamic of where four-year institutions are going uh, and what the communication looks like. And again, that speaks back to the idea that okay, you've got a lot of intensified communications between four-year and two-year institutions. There are going to be some rough edges in there. Another reason why we got involved um, with, with setting up some, some new standards. Um, this, this slide really is just the acceptance rate, average acceptance rates um, for transfer versus first-time freshmen. And from a statistical standpoint, these two numbers are practically identical because of the margin of error in our survey work. Um, but uh, you can see that it's pretty comparable. So transfer students generally stand a pretty good chance of being admitted to the colleges that they're interested in. Uh, and in many ways, the application review process resembles the first-time undergraduate process. Slightly different set of um, 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 factors because you have a, a, a year or two of grades from an actual institution of higher ed, and unsurprisingly, that's the top factor uh, in, in the four-year admission decisions. But then outside of that, there are a lot of different ways in which transfer students need to be communicated, different, communicated with differently than your first time population. Uh, so that's yet another reason why we felt it was important for us to get involved. Uh, here is an interesting statistic, and, and that is that the yield rate for transfer students is much higher than it is for first time, uh, first year applicants. And the reason that's significant is a couple of things. One, Transfer students are generally more focused. They kind of know where they want to go, or maybe it's even preordained through the articulation agreements. Uh, but it's also important because for admission offices, yield is a really big statistic. Uh, and with transfer students yielding at half, basically, of the applicant pool, you can expect to show up. It's a pretty attractive target. And again, we go back to our market, you know, sort of analogy there. Um, again, you want to make sure that, that if, if these students are this valuable to those institutions, that there's a a really fair sort of uh, way of going about that communication so that students come first in the equation. Uh, the last slide that I'll show you before I turn it over to Michelle is, is that more than one-third of college students transfer during their post-secondary experience. If you haven't already seen it, the Government Accountability Office issued a, a report on transfer just a few months back. Uh, and I, don't, I think for this group it wouldn't be anything that you don't already know. But it's really neat to see it in the federal government's sort of um, you know, research arm that it's coming out, that, that members of Congress read this, that this is a very important thing. And I just, I conclude with this slide only because, once again, uh, this is a significant part of our student population. 
And way back in 1937, when NACAC was founded, uh, the main interest we had was protecting students because we knew there was just all sorts of possibilities for everything ranging from confusion to misrepresentation. So this sort of sets the table that over the last couple of decades, as transfer has become much more important, we've been asked by our members to really take this in co into consideration. And that's where Michelle and her colleagues on the steering committee proved so effective, in my opinion, and maybe I'm not uh, objective, but, but the fact of the matter is I think they did a very good job of going through the old document, coming up with something that was very focused and very clear, uh, and it, it constituted our first step into the realm of, of really helping, trying to help this transfer population. So I'll turn it over to you, Great. Michelle. Um, I think the research stresses the importance of transfer, which I think everyone in this room agrees with. That's why you're here at this conference. So um, we're excited to share with you what we're working on at NACAC and um, what's been put in place after uh, lengthy, um, actually, committee work that I'm going to tell you about. I'm excited to see NACAC really moving forward with um, a document that includes protections for transfer students in the admission process. So um, yeah, so we can move right in, yeah. So it all started uh, with an invitation in um, spring, in February to be exact, of 2016, where individuals were invited by NACAC to form a steering committee on admission practices. And the unique part of this steering committee and this invitation was that the individuals that were invited, as you can see from this list, are very diverse. From four-year public, from four-year private, from, um, se from secondary schools, public and private, from elite schools, from state schools, independent counselors. So a really diverse group. And in all my work with NACAC, because I previously served on the Current Issues and Future Trends Committee, I was really surprised with how large this committee was. It's one of the largest committees I've seen within NACAC of 19 members. And there was some intention with having such a large committee um, because NACAC was so dedicated to wanting to get input from so many different levels and viewpoints that all these people had an expertise and had a background and experience that was um, crucial and, and was why they were invited um, to be a member of this steering committee. So our first meeting was in June of 2016 where we came together and um, our charge was basically to look at the SPGP that NACAC has had in place, the Statements and Principles of Good Practice, and to look at it and, and figure out if we needed a new SPGP or if we needed to edit the SPGP or if we needed to start over and, and rewrite it. it. It was an interesting charge because it wasn't really a clear charge. It was, it was really a focus on we know this document that was created to protect students had been amended so many times over the years and we know that the landscape of higher education has changed so dramatically over, over the years that we didn't feel the document was really serving the purpose it was initially created um, to serve. And so our charge was to look at it and determine what needed to be changed, amended, edited, rewritten, um, and then kind of go from there. That was kind of our initial charge. So I'll go through kind of the objectives of what our committee decided was important. Um, first of all, we did decide we were going to have to just start from scratch and rewrite um, the SBGP, knowing that some of what was in it was going to remain, but that some new things needed to come into play. Um, so our objectives were, first of all, to protect students from any unethical recruitment practices. Um, that's always been a, a really core component of the SBGP. We wanted to make sure the statement was clear and could be broadly applied um, across um, you know, the ethical principles and rules and could be implemented. So for example, we wanted to make sure new professionals coming into the practice could utilize this document as a training document and an educational document so they could learn what is allowed, what isn't allowed, and what do we do as a profession to help students. Um, we wanted to have rationales for the rules. We wanted to make the document easy. It got complex and complicated over time. And a lot of new professionals were telling us they didn't really understand it, so they didn't really use it. We wanted to make sure that both sides of the desk found it helpful, and both sides meaning the high school counselors working with students to transition 
and the college admission counselors at both two-year and four-year institutions. And then, of course, it's an ethical document, and so that was really important that we maintained that within the document. So after 18 months of work, we had a very aggressive um, timeline for rewriting this document. We wanted to get, we decided during that time, we wanted to get as much input as possible. So this is a list of everybody that gave input, um, feedback and opinions and ideas um, related to our draft documents. There was a number of drafts that we went through, obviously. Um, because writing by committee is never fun. <laughs> so yes, we did break down into subcommittees. We had to do that to get the work done. Um, but you can see here from this list that not only was the committee diverse, but the input that we got was very diverse from a large um, group of different individuals with different experiences and backgrounds. One thing I want to um, point out too is this attendance, attendees at affiliate conferences. So we made an effort to go to every state ACAC conference and present the draft changes and ask for feedback at the conference and through an online web form where people could provide feedback. So I think that was really important to us to get our members feedback also. Um, so that was, I think, a really, a really nice way to go about getting as much feedback as possible. Yeah. Okay. So um, just a few basics um, about the new SBGP. So the new SBGP, which has a new name, and I have to get used to the new name and quit saying SBGP all the time, it is, um, it's now the SBGP CEEP, CEPP. See, I still can't get it right. Um, the, the new document was adopted at our national conference in Boston in September of this past year. Um, and we knew there was a lot of overlap between the old document and the new document, so anything that was an overlap that had already existed would be enforced immediately, but the new parts that we put into it, for example, the transfer section that I'm going to talk about, the new parts we were giving institutions one year to, to put in place. So we wouldn't expect them after we pass it at the fall conference to implement it the next week. I mean, that's just impossible for some institutions. Um, so we gave them a year. By this um, September 2018 at our national conference, which is going to be um, in Salt Lake City, it, um, schools have to be in compliance okay, with the new guidelines. So they have one year really to implement. A couple things about the old document that we decided was very confusing and do not have in the new document. The old document had two sections. It had a mandatory section and a best practices section. The mandatory section we enforced, and it was, you cannot do this. You have to do this. The best practices section was, we recommend you do this. It's the best interest in the students if you do this. But the mandatory um, practices, were, or the mandatory section was the only section that was enforced. And we thought, this is really confusing. Like, if we're going to tell people what they can and can't do, let's just tell them and let's enforce it. So we got rid of those two different sections, which you'll see in a minute, which I think is a really good thing. It's all mandatory. There's no best practices. Everything in it is enforceable. So now I'm going to talk about the new Code of Ethics and Professional Practices, CEPP. There's four sections of the document. And um, like David said, it's out at the NACAC table. It's, a, it's I think, for, it looks like this. So it's pretty blue and gray, white colors, and I think it's pretty easy to read, which I think is a big difference in the documents. You can read it on your flight home, especially if you have a short flight. <laughs> and um, a couple new things with the documents. So before I get into the sections, we did include an introduction, which we had in the old one, but we changed the introduction. And I want to I want to read this because I think it's really key for this group to know that we added transfer wording into the introduction, which never existed before. So it says in the document introduction that basically the document reflects NACAC's longstanding commitment to principal conduct amongst professionals who support students in college transition process from secondary schools to post-secondary education. And that's where it ended in the old document. And then we added and in the transfer process between post-secondary institutions. 
So not only it is, in, it, is it in the introduction of the document, but it's also weaved in throughout the document and has its own section. So I think that's really exciting and, and worth noting. The other new thing with the new document is we added a preamble, which we never had before. This was fun to write and rewrite 100 times. Let me tell you about that. Um, but the preamble um, is just to give people you know, a sense of what it's all about besides an introduction. So it talks about kind of the ethics of the profession. And it talks about the reason we do this is for the students. Okay. So the section one, the ethical core of college admission, is really um, advocating for the students and really about developing trust because if students can't trust us, the professionals, either at the high school level, the community college level, or the college level, then who can they trust? So we have to make sure that we're transparent in what we tell them, that we're complete and truthful and factual, and that we have information um, readily accessible for them. Um, so that students can make informed choices about college. So this is what this section one is all about. Of course, professional conduct is important because we represent the, the um, profession. And respect for confidentiality, of course, that ties all in with trust. So that's the first section. The second section talks about the, basically the responsible practices of college admission. And then it's broken down um, into the different types of practices. So this is kind of the gut of the document. Um, some of these had, many of these had existed in the previous document. So for example, um, the application plans for first time undergraduates in the US. This basically talks about the different type of admission plans, like a standard plan, a regular admission, rolling decision, early action, you know, what you can and can't do with these. And then B, the admission cycles, date, dates and deadline. I mean, the big thing in here is May 1st, the national candidates reply deadline. We got a lot of feedback, don't get rid of May 1st. Everybody wanted to keep May 1st, so we never wanted to or thought about getting rid of May 1st, so we just kind of eased everyone's um, stress and told them May 1st is staying, as, as is October 15th, as the first date that um, schools can require a student supply, this first date they can have as a deadline. So May 1st and October 15th are in the B section and we're in the previous document, and um, a lot of people were happy that that didn't go away. Wait lists were in the previous document, but then here we are with number D, transfer admission. Brand new. There was never a section on transfer admission. I'm going to talk in more detail about that section. The other new thing that I just want to uh, make note of is E is new. So we realized with um, the use of commissioned agents in international student recruitment, this was a big issue about the um, transparency of commissioned agents and the fairness to students that were with agents. So we have a whole section that addresses this, which if you use agents, I would encourage you to take a look at that section. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but it's worth um, looking at. Then sections three and four are, section three are the definitions and the glossary. Oh, and the other cool thing about the definitions and glossary is we have a definition for transfer students. Page 12, which I'm going to read to you, because it's so exciting. Transfer student definition. Transfer students have typically earned or attempted college level course credits after graduating from secondary school and are applying as matriculants from one undergraduate institution to another. The definition of a transfer student is determined by the receiving institution and may be based on the number of credits earned or attempted at the student's previous institution. So we know some four-year schools say, well, if you have less than 10 or 12 credit hours, we're not going to consider you a transfer student. You're still going to come in based on our freshman admission requirements. We know that. That's OK. We're still saying we, we realize and recognize schools do that. Um, but this definition of transfer students, I think, is just worth noting that that's in there, um, that, that's showing the importance NACAC is, is putting on it. And I was really happy that we, we added that. And then section four, the educational monitoring and compliance. So since everything is mandatory, everything is enforceable, which is, of course, a challenge. Um, but this is, these are some of the penalties if students, or if students, I'm sorry, if schools are, are found by not complying with the um, SPGP, CEPP, 
then really, you know, the goal of NACAC and the affiliates is really not to be uh, punitive, to not, you know, try to find people that are not abiding by it and get, you know, say you're out, you can't be a member. The goal is to educate institutions on the fair practices so that they can change their practices and be fair towards students. So we always kind of focus around education first. If a school is doing something that is not in compliance, many times the school doesn't even realize they're not in compliance. So we talk to them first about education, about what they can do to change their current practices to be in compliance. And then if they still choose not to be in compliance, that's when a penalty might be um, sanctioned, such as not allowed to participate in ACAC-sponsored events, which college fairs are a big one that schools want to participate in. And then, of course, membership could be supervised or could be um, suspended or terminated, which hopefully we don't get to that, but um, that is in there. Okay, here we go with the good stuff. Okay, now I want to warn you guys, these slides are really wordy because they are basically the transfer section of this document. So I'm not going to read them to you because you can all read and you can all pick up one of these documents and, and take a look at it um, later during this conference or on your plane ride home. And I am just going to kind of talk about the overarching theme of each of these areas of the transfer section, and then I'm going to give some examples, and then David's going to jump in if he wants to add anything that I'm forgetting about or missing. Or, Okay, so I'm going to get to that section in here and go through it with you. I want to show it to you guys first so you know that it's really easy and how come I can't find it? I should have had it marked. Yeah, oh, do you want to take a break certainly. here? Is this a good time to pause and ask questions from what, what was presented so far? Actually, I have a question about the last paragraph yeah. of this slide. Mm -hmm. So my question there is, you know, what if an institution can't do that? Um, you know, it says that transfer candidates may not be asked to make a commitment to enroll until after they are able to review financial aid award and an estimate of how many credits mm -hmm. they earn will transfer. What if that can't be done before they have to make their decision to commit to the admission offer? Yep, yep. Okay, so I got, I'm going to answer that. I got to the page. This is it. This is our page on transfer admission guiding principles and rationale. And the first paragraph is this, okay? So this talks about really what's going to be explained in the one, two, three, and fours that's coming. This is kind of the overarching philosophy and the reality of transfer students. So when we met as a committee, um, so the subcommittee, oh, I wanted to share with you the subcommittee. The subcommittee that worked on the transfer admission was a combination of individuals from different types of schools. And so we had someone from Indiana University. I was um, chairing the subcommittee. We had an independent counselor, a retired counselor, a re retired high school counselor who's now serving as an independent counselor. We had someone from a four-year um, private school. Um, and a, I want to, yeah, I think that, that we had a small group of like five of us working on this section. Um, and this is what we decided after numerous conference calls. It's really hard to put sanctions and requirements on transfer admission because everybody does transfer admission so differently. And we, we realize that transfer students are so different, right? Some might be traditional transfer students going from high school to a two year to a four year, but most are not. Most are stopping out or are swirling or are going part time or you know, are, are, many are working. So this whole um, first opening paragraph just talked about how really our goal in writing this section was that we could stress that schools need to be fair and transparent in their admission practices and policies for transfer students, meaning that they had to let them know. They had to have the information somewhere so students aren't caught off guard um, and having to make decisions without all the information. So I'm going to get to that section in another slide and then I'll answer your question because it's a good question and, and I've had it from other, um, from other people too. So it was kind of one of the sticky ones that came about. 
But let me start with point one, which is the next slide. So this talks about um, that NACAC is not going to set specific dates and deadlines like a May 1st National Candidate Reply deadline or like a, um, a deadline to apply. We're not going to state that, but we are saying that colleges that accept transfer students have to clearly state their deadlines in their publications. And when I say publications, I'm talking about internet, print, you know, whatever they're using to promote their school. And also, not only do they have to state their admission deadlines, but they have to talk about um, financial aid, scholarships, and housing for transfer students. They have to be tr transparent about whether or not they have those available for transfer students. So do they have housing for transfer students and scholarships, or do they not? And um, we have here that colleges must make a good faith effort to be flexible in enforcing um, deadlines so candidates have opportunities to assess their transfer financial aid course registrations and credit evaluation options. So when we say flexible, we don't mean that they have to adapt to every student's request and need and, and, and um, demand, but we mean if the students meet the deadlines the school has set forth, then they have to try to also be flexible in these ways, and I'll show you on another slide um, to address the question asked, um, how we plan to enforce that and what that really means. And then the second part, colleges will be transparent and publish their admission requirements for transfer candidates, including any restrictions or limitations on particular majors or programs. So an example of this is, um, okay, so I'm the U of I and I accept transfer students into my College of Engineering, but in the past seven years, uh, there's never been a transfer student accepted to aerospace engineering. But they can get into civil or electrical. So we're saying schools must be transparent. If, if you don't accept transfer students to a certain major or program, or if you have data that shows that they don't typically get accepted or haven't, we want the schools to be transparent with that so students aren't wasting their time and money applying to those programs, knowing that they are likely not to be accepted. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. It might be that no student was accepted to a particular program because they didn't meet prerequisite requirements as opposed to the program doesn't have room for any transfer students, right? So yeah. yeah, absolutely. But that's different because with the transparency, we are requiring that the schools list their admission requirements. So they would list you need a minimum GPA of this, you need minimum courses in this curriculum. Okay. So they have to first, of course, meet the minimum requirements. Okay. Yeah, that would be first before. Um, so this would be if students met those minimum requirements and still weren't admissible because there's no seats available. Yeah, in the back. In regards to programs that maybe you have like those programs in the School of Engineering, mm -hmm. um, so does this say that the students that are So NACIC is not dictating where it's listed as long as it's listed. And in the transparency, it would be helpful if the admission page said there's some programs that are limited, see the engineering page, because we know those things might change. And to keep up with that, it's often in the college rather than the admission office. So it's more about the transparency, but we don't dictate where it says it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the third point was that colleges will publish um, their up-to-date lists of institutions that they have articulated transfer agreements with and include courses and credits that transfer and minimum GPAs that are accepted for transfer. So for example, Illinois has what, what's called the IAI, Illinois Articulation Initiative. It's an online transfer agreement site where students can plug in, like if I take this at the community college, what will transfer to you know, the Illinois state system or to one of the Illinois schools. And this is just saying that the colleges have that information available, whether it's a link on your website or whether they have the articulation agreements on their website, but to have what they have available um, available for students. So if you know things transfer or don't transfer, have that available for students. And then the minimum GPA 
is comes kind of back to the question about if you don't meet the minimum GPA and you're not admissible, then you're not admissible as long as it's transparent and it's published is really what NACAC is focusing on. Okay. Okay. Here's where we get to um, more of the question that was asked earlier. So we know that transfer students' biggest questions when transferring is what's going to transfer, how long is it going to take me to complete, and how much is it going to cost, right? And those are the barriers to persistence and completion for many transfer students. And those are also many of the reasons students are really nervous to start at a community college because they're worried their classes aren't going to transfer. So this section addresses that. This section did get a lot of feedback and was rewritten a number of times. So I'm glad you asked the question because you're not the only one that asked it. And um, I want to make sure everyone's clear on it. So what this is saying is that colleges must make a good faith estimate on how credits will transfer and be applied towards their graduation and must be able to give them a good faith estimate on their financial aid award notification as long as the student meets all the deadlines the college has, um, has indicated on their website. So the caveat to this is really right here in number C. We know because many schools, oh, thanks. We know because many schools gave us feedback and said, we as the admission office don't have control over credit evaluations, over financial aid. Those are other offices doing that work. So how can we enforce that? That's not fair to us as an admission office. So what we added then is that, OK, we understand that everyone doesn't have control in an admission office, especially if you're at a big institution. University of Michigan was one that was pretty vocal on this. Right, big institution, competitive institution, a lot of colleges making decisions about what's going to transfer and what's not based on the major. So we said, okay, if you can't, then you either ha have a couple options. You either extend your deposit deadline until students have the information, or you have them deposit, and if once they get that information, it's not feasible for them to transfer there because they either can't afford it or it's going to take too much longer for them to complete their degree, then you need to refund their deposit. This is for the protection of transfer students. And I know it's going to be a hard swallow for some institutions because it forces them to do the work that they've been avoiding for many years. I beg to differ with that statement. I apologize for this, but when you're a large institution and you're enrolling 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 transfer students every fall term, mm -hmm. you have to wait until you get the final official transcript mm -hmm. so that you can evaluate the transfer yeah. credit and see where it goes. So right. how do you expect a, an office, whether it's housed in admission or the registrar's office, to have staff who can get all that done by before your commitment deadline date. That's right. Well, that's why we're saying that you can extend it. If you can't get it done by the commitment deadline date, that's when we're saying an extension an should extension be allowed. Work if you're trying to do enrollment management. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be argumentative, yeah. but that no, no. is going to be very difficult for my institutions. Well, one, one thing that, that, that I can say to speak to, to your question and your concern is that we had that very discussion in the, in the steering committee because there were institutions that were large that have a lot of transfer students. The, the real key to this is the red text there, which is good faith estimate, because we went over the fact that there's no way a lot of institutions can do the full evaluation, right? So what does a good faith estimate mean? I'm going to write this down. Right. Well, and this is not for me to interpret necessarily, but I can relate to you what the conversation was on the steering committee, mm -hmm. which is that a good faith effort is the, is the best effort the institution can make. So in a case of an institution that has thousands of transfers coming in with each fall term, it might be sufficient for the, the university admission office to say, based on data that we have on transfer credits over the past 10 years, which would include some 40,000 students, these are courses that typically transfer. These are courses that don't. That is a good faith estimate. Okay. You're not telling a student, you're going to get this, or based on your individual transcript, you're likely to get this. It could, it could be that, 
an individualized because some places don't have that many transfers. Others might, it mm -hmm. might simply be, look, this is what, the best we can tell you right now. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's, that good faith estimate is the real key to that. Yeah, that's good, David. And thank you for adding that. And I think, you know who might be a good resource to talk to is Sasha Timi. She's the director of undergraduate admissions at Indiana University Bloomington, who admits a class of thousands every year and many transfer students. And she was on the subcommittee that helped with this section because she too said that this is gonna be challenging. I'm gonna to have to educate my colleges and my department chairs on the importance of this. But she knows that the institution does collect information as students transfer. They collect the classes that have transferred and then they can shoot that back out to prospective students as a good faith estimate of this is what's transferred in the past, this is what's likely gonna transfer when you come. Yeah. Oh, I love it. This is so exciting. I think the back hands are up first and then we'll come, we'll work towards the front, okay? Yeah. Okay, the faith estimate, we actually, we, we're a banner school, so we actually have that database available to students before they even apply. So nice. we're actually transferring from another, we have it for our, these, I'm from Virginia, so we have it for the BCCS separately, but for any four-year school or two-year school outside of Virginia, we publish right up front, this is what we've transferred in before. If you don't see your class on there, that doesn't mean it's not gonna transfer, we just haven't evaluated that course previously. Yeah, that's great. So it's already there for them, so we don't have to worry about it them potentially not getting that good estimate yeah. in a timely manner. That's great, thank you for sharing. Yeah, back here. Is the intent to provide the good faith estimate to all admitted students or admitted students who request it? Well, the intent is to provide it for all admitted transfer students prior to requiring a deposit. So if they withdraw, then you wouldn't provide it, obviously. Or if they apply after your deposit deadline, but it's for all students, not by request only. Yeah. Um, I'm at Mayo University, and we've been dealing with some of this, uh, with some heated things between departments recently. What we're settling in on is we have something called an equivalent course tool online that has exactly what you have. We also have all of our major academic planners online. So for any major, any degree, you can go see the prescribed course in a suggested sequence. So between those two, any student can look at their own transcript and see what they've got and where they are. The problem is nobody tells them it's out there. Mm. And our admissions officers go, oh, look, you've got 55 hours. You're going to get finished in four semesters. They have no idea whether their credits apply to what they're coming in with or not. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is re-educating re our admissions counselors, mm -hmm. point the student to the department, point the student to the tools on the website, point them to their advisor, and they can get an exact picture of what's what. So we're just re educating where that happens. That's great. And yeah. That's what's going to help us out. That's great. Yeah. And that's what um, Sasha Timi from Indiana University talks about too, educating the colleges and the department chairs. Because they don't know. They're experts in their field. They don't know what what admission rules exist, right? Yeah. I'm curious. Um, I'm from the University of Arkansas. We admit about 3,000 transfer students every, well, in the fall. So we're relatively large, but we don't have an admissions deposit, a zero deposit. So what I'm wondering is what I usually battle with our operations side. Um, we have the course equivalency guide, and thank goodness we're educated. We never tell people, oh, you got 55 hours again. Uh, so in admissions, we're really clear on making sure you may have this many credits, but where do they fit into your degree plan? But where we run into the problem is, let's say a student, whether or not they've come from several institutions and they're not on the course equivalency guide, they're then asking for their application feedback. And we've always been like, you know, no, once a transfer student's been admitted, I mean, it's only, you know, $50 from out of state. So what I'm wondering is, that in a sense is the only fee that they have to pay. Now, I know it's an admissions deposit, mm -hmm. but I'm always like, this isn't the best practice. I mean, what's 40 or 50 bucks to give back to the student? Because we always just say your only risk is the application fee. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is anyone else not have an admissions deposit? Because the U of A does not. You can request. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. going to be my question, yeah. too. 
because our institution actually is all the kids. See, we have a question yeah. over here. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, our our institution kind of has. We don't have a deposit fee either, and we actually just waived now indefinitely our app fee. So. But what we do is we have app matriculation, so as soon as they register or get to that point of registration, we have a registration slash orientation slash mm -hmm. potential enrollment. We have that as well. Okay. So is that then, because it, that fee affects admissions as well as the office that houses registration and orientation, mm -hmm. is that considered that fee? Well, do, do they pay that fee when they register? So they're basically committing by registering. So, but even if, let's say, they couldn't get, like it's common in the spring, we move those dates up to be more competitive, the registration date. So if it's before May, and they then, let's say they choose to register, because this happens often, okay. they choose to register, and then all of a sudden, they're registering at two different institutions to see what classes they get into, and then they decide to drop. Now, is that $100 fee that's used by three different places is that oh, interesting. We only stated a deposit, so I don't think it would cover a registration or those additional fees, because in the document it really says a deposit. So deposit meaning your confirmation that you're coming. Right. I, I would note, I would just add that we do have an admission practices committee at NACAC that has an, uh, oversight over this document. And we do get questions all the time from colleges saying, hey, we have an example, we have a case or a question. Don't hesitate to contact NACAC about that. Because we don't turn around and go, ah, oh, well, you know. It's more that we, we exist in an advisory capacity mm -hmm. as well. And, and most of the time, with anything that has not complied with the principles of good practice, when you call people, or when they call you or you call people, they will say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that, and they will do it. So, you know, for the most part, just trying to make sure, as, as Michelle said, that you're protecting students because, unfortunately, there are some unsavory people out there, and I don't think that in our nonprofit uh, colleges, for the most part, but you want to make sure that students are being protected. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, questions are great questions. Yeah. Ones that they've wrestled with, for sure. Should we move on? Yeah, we, we, we only have a couple more slides, but okay, so I'm going to move on and then we can continue discussion at the end, but I want to make sure we get through everything. We have about 10 minutes. Um, so the fifth point in the new transfer section basically talks about um, students, uh, okay, wait, let me make sure, yeah. So colleges cannot solicit transfer applications from previous year's application pool unless they are already at like a community college or a school that they would typically transfer from or unless the student has verified with the school that they're not enrolled anywhere, okay? So an example of this is I have someone apply to my institution that doesn't come this fall and then in the spring I send them information about we'd love to have you still come here um, we have additional scholarship money for you. I'm trying to lure them back to my school. That's not allowed unless you know that the student isn't already at another four-year institution, hasn't committed, okay? So that's to protect students from being torn from place to place over incent from, you know, with incentives, like financial aid incentives or other incentives. Okay. Moving on to number six. So here's our final slide. Um, and this basically is that to facilitate transfer colleges from which students are listing their transferring need to provide accurate, legible, and complete transcripts. So this one wasn't very controversial because I think everybody agrees. So if I'm transferring from one school to another, the school that I'm coming from needs to provide transcripts that are legible um, so that the school that I'm transferring to can read them and evaluate them and give credit. Um, and I would even say that this is almost the, the flip side of the coin for the receiving institutions that are being asked to provide good faith estimates that that whole process is predicated on getting good information from the sending colleges. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so that's the sixth and last point. I think that, David, you wanted to say a couple things. You know, we, we definitely have put new, new uh, transfer content out on, on the NACAC website. This is just where to find the point of entry for that. 
We do tend to link out to everything else that we do throughout the association through this one hub. So if you really are coming at this and wondering what is NACAC doing for transfer, this is your one-stop shop. Um, we, the little E down there is that we do have a new e-learning uh, course on financial aid, really targeted at entry level, um, high school counseling, transfer advising, and college admission staff on either end of the spectrum. Um, just, to, just to sort of make sure everybody has a working knowledge of, of what's, what's out there, we've, we've been told loud and clear by a whole bunch of constituencies within NACAC, including the transfer constituency that, that that was needed. So that's a new thing that, that we want to, uh, to emphasize. The, other, the only other point that I'll make, and then we can have any other questions that you have, is that uh, Steph um, sorry, Michelle. Wow, Stephanie Niles is our president-elect. I'm yeah. thinking yeah. there's so many leaders over 18 years, they start to pile up in your head. <laughs> Michelle mentioned at the beginning that the very first section of the, the, the CEPP, as we're calling it now, uh, is aimed more at professional conduct. And so that is also relevant. That's relevant to all of our members, no matter what sector you're in. Uh, we didn't choose to go over that because, as, as Michelle said, it's a gripping read. And I would encourage you, if you had a flight <laughs> like I did today, five hours from DC to here, uh, that, that you could read that. Um, and that's, that's still a very important part of the process. But we really did want to spend most of our time on, on what was really designed especially for this, for this group. So with that, do you have any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. And that's a that's a story we've heard from all sides in the in the process. And we wanted to make sure I think that we took care of of that part of the process as best we could. That yes. Yeah, I have a question about number five. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about uh, previous prospect tools. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, students don't always know when they're going to be transferring in. And quite often, they don't transfer in the semester that they tell us they're planning to, mm -hmm. um, because things happen. Um, so that being said, this leads you to think that like, if the students said that they were transferring in for spring 2018, but then they didn't, does this mean that we can no longer talk to them? Is I mean, the way I interpret it, they have to reach out to you, but we will reach out to them. We know that students don't always tell us what their plans are, right? So we have to make a good faith effort to try to collect that information from the students we don't hear from if we want to continue to solicit them. So an example um, of what we do at the community college that I'm at is we send emails over the summer to all our applicants who haven't confirmed. We don't have a deposit either, but they confirm by signing up for new student orientation, right? And going through that process, similar to yours. But those that aren't completing the process and going through new student orientation, we send them an email asking them, you know, we're happy you applied to Oakton. We're just curious to know where you are in your process. Are you attending another school in the fall? Not attending anywhere because you're taking a gap year or time off or semester off or not sure yet what you're doing. And for the students that say, I'm attending another school, they are off our list. Right. Yeah. But the ones. Applicant. That's yes. not applicant. I'm thinking, I'm talking specifically about the prospect. So, well, I have a suggestion. What we have done to protect ourselves is we take the file, drop it in clearinghouse. If we don't exactly. see an enrollment history, we can still communicate with the student. So that saves oh, yeah, us in ensuring that we're in compliance with whoever. We don't want to offend any of our institution partner and institutional partner. Right. Right. And it just protects us from being able to communicate with the student. So if they're at a community college or if they're at no other college, we just keep them in the database. In fact, that's exactly what the steering committee talked about, that you could do things like that. Michelle, is it appropriate, like in that survey, to ask, like, you know, are you, like I'm attending a four-year institution, maybe the very last question, are you interested in, uh, can you ask them to let them self-select yes. as you wish? Yes. Because a lot of our students, if they don't get, like, we have a, out of state scholarship, if they need a certain GPA, um, they get almost in state tuition. So right, right. Very attractive to 
from uh, Texans coming to Arkansas. Okay. And so they may not meet that in RTA, that, that award as a freshman. So they will go to their local community college for a semester just to be eligible for that huge award. So a lot of the freshmen that don't select, they really have intended to <coughs> Is that appropriate to let them self-disclose that, yes, please stay in contact right. me. Because most of our transfer students, from, especially from out of state, they're already in our process. Uh, they, they applied as a freshman. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be fine if they disclose to you that they're interested in transferring in the future. Say it asking, like, basically, so what? The, the way the that? steering committee talked mm -hmm. about that was that it was very important that if you do go through your prospect slash applicant pool after your uh -huh. May 1, after your yield and all that, that, that as long as it's, it's in the context of saying, we're curious to know, right. did you, and, and, and then that's really it, unless the student reaches back to you and says, right. we want this, or just independent of any communication from you. So if they say, select the box saying, I am interested in possibly you know, receiving transfer information in the future, and then leave it at that, you can then yeah. use that to solicit? It seems like that would be perfectly that, fine. And again, that's a good question for the committee, because mm -hmm. I'm, as a staff person, not don't have license to, to provide you a definitive answer. All I can say is that the steering committee talked about that issue mm -hmm. and the idea that it would be sort of a final communication mm -hmm. that could potentially say, let us know if you'd like to stay on our list, <coughs> but beyond that, they're done. That's, that's the way they talked about yeah, it. Yeah, the spirit of this one is really to avoid schools from going after students that have already committed to another school by saying, come to my school, I'll give you more money, or I'll give you more transfer credit, or I'll get, let you graduate sooner, right? So that's the spirit of this. But if students indicate, eventually I want to transfer to your school, then I think it's perfectly fine. Yeah. One last question, and then we're going to let you guys go, because I think, yeah. So she, you know, is at a, a school down in North Carolina, and one of the schools that she applied to over Christmas break emailed us and said, "Hey, you know, we just want to know: Are you happy? Are you not happy? Oh, you're just not oh. the ship, so yeah. you're available." That's you know, not I right. Off my shirt, like, oh my gosh, did they just do yeah. what I think they yeah. did? Yeah. So, that, so that's what I think that. Yeah, my, my son got one of those letters too, actually, after his first year of college. Yeah, he did. And I was like, hmm, they don't know who their son is, too. <laughs> okay, I have one last question. Yeah. Go back to the effective date. I think that was one of the very first slides. Because I, I know when you said that, you know, the part that was already there mm -hmm. was effective immediately. Yes. The new stuff you said takes a full effect. year. Oh, you, uh, in September of 20. Yeah, a full year. Mm -hmm. So this coming September. Yeah, so there's. Yeah. That affects my transfer class for fall 19. Yes. I realized that this yes. was, this was um, what do you call it, passed, ratified, yeah. Yeah. right at the beginning of the admission cycle. So we, we had to wait a cycle. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks everybody for coming.